Hi, welcome to Politically Speaking on Rogers TV. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Dave Salasi. I'm wearing my United Nations tie today because we're acknowledging Human Rights Week, Human Rights Day, uh, and that leads us into the topic for our guest, speaking with our guest tonight. The country of South Sudan was forged in 2011 after decades of civil war in Sudan. It remains wrecked by war, wracked by war. The conflict has involved numerous gross human rights violations, severe food insecurity and famine affecting more than six million people. Awak Deng is involved in the national women's programming for the South Sudan Council of Churches. She is touring Canada, uh, sharing her story about the grassroots organizations, largely run by women, which are working to create a sustainable peace in the war-torn African country. I'll also be joined by Jim Davis. He's Africa Partnerships Coordinator for Kairos Canada, an ecumenical church organization which is sponsoring the tour as part of the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence. Hello. Thank you very much for coming and joining Thank us tonight. You. Jim, very good Pleasure. to see you. Thanks for joining. Um, let, let's start with a little bit of context, if we can, because I'm not sure that uh, many people joining us tonight today will be familiar with the background of the conflict in, the, in Sudan and South Sudan. Can you provide us a little bit of the, that context? Well, there was a decades-long um, uh, civil war uh, between the, the South and the North. Um, and, uh, in the that, Sudan. In the, in the Sudan. And that began in, uh, in 1955 and sort of went to uh, 1972. And then there was a lull. So a long drawn out civil a war. Long drawn out. Then it started. Perhaps, perhaps maybe we can just get the map of uh, Africa sure. up for a second just sure. so people can identify well, where we're talking about. And you can see it there. Okay, so, so you want to just describe where, where Sudan is located? So Sudan is uh, uh, surrounded by uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, um, Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, uh, Chad, and Egypt, uh, and Egypt going uh, in a clockwise uh, manner. So the south uh, is uh, an oil-rich area uh, in, the, in the extreme south. It's more temperate uh, there, um, but uh, with heavier rainfall. But as I said, this uh, civil war to devolve uh, their, uh, uh, their political aspirations um, uh, started in the mid-50s and then it broke off in uh, 1972 and there was a lull uh, with uh, um, fits and starts of peace and then it broke out again in 1983 and continued on essentially up until uh, 2005 when uh, there was a series of, of uh, peace negotiations that w culminated in the Comprehensive Peace uh, Agreement, the CPA. And uh, part of that agreement was that it would lead to a referendum as to whether uh, South Sudan would become independent. And indeed, uh, in early 2011, uh, there was an overwhelming 98, 99% of uh, South Sudanese and uh, those in diaspora that had registered. Um, I, was a, I was a monitor with the International Organization of Migration for uh, voting in Canada. That resulted in uh, the independence of, uh, of, of South Sudan. So, um, but subsequent to that, um, in late 2013, um, the uh, Sudan People's Liberation Movement, which was the ruling power, the, the, the movement and the army, uh, there was a political difference between their two leaders. And so the splinter group known as the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and Army in opposition um, broke away. Um, and uh, there were agreements to try to uh, resolve that um, in 2014, 15, um, in fits and starts, but that didn't last. And the neighboring countries, which are part of uh, the uh, Intergovernmental Agency on Development, EGAD, uh, were to assure, along with the African Union, that that peace accord held, but it, it didn't. And uh, so it, it fell apart again. So. Uh, as as we speak, they're looking at uh, 
renewing that agreement, but in fact, it, uh, everything else being equal, it will expire uh, in the first half of 2018. Mm. And there's still violence going on, o open violence going on in the country right now. There is, yes. It's sporadic in different places. Um, and uh, so, but there's been a fracturing and splintering of the opposition groups as well, to, just to make it uh, even more complex. So mm -hmm. there are some two million refugees and uh, maybe twice as many internally displaced people who live in, uh, they call them protection of civilian camps. These are internally displaced persons, IDP camps, but they're run by the UN which tries to protect the people because they are very vulnerable to uh, armed groups, um, which, which makes it even more of a complex uh, situation. I want to come back to this, uh, the, the impact upon the population, the impact of the war, the impact of the, uh, the continuing violence in a moment. But just before we move on, the, the South Sudan Council of Churches well, can you speak about that organization that you're affiliated with? Um, what does who the organization encompass? It's an ecumenical uh, body which is consists of uh, seven seven churches and um, uh, three uh, like affiliates. So um, the the total number of churches is uh, ten churches, which is the, like the body of the South Sudan uh, Council uh, Council of Churches, including uh, Presbyterian Evangelical Church which I, 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 I came from. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, they have a women, uh, women uh, program uh, within the South Sudan Council, uh, Council uh, of Churches, in which they are uh, working with women in grassroots, they are working in um, women in, uh, in the political positions. They are, they are reaching women in uh, all kinds of different uh, of levels. They are working also with youth. Which also I came I came in yeah because I'm working in coordination with South Sudan Council of Churches as a youth uh, coordinator also so uh, and it, it it was from uh, 2013 because early there was Sudan Council of Churches and after the referendum and the two countries split become now South Sudan and Sudan so the South Sudan Council of Churches was uh, was formed in 2013. Uh, and that was actually by uh, Kairos' help. They was uh, they have a big role they played in, in forming the new uh, South Sudan Council of Judges. And is it, it still retains assistance from uh, church organizations outside of Sudan? Right? Um, yes, um, like uh, they are working with uh, organization like Kairos, and uh, there is uh, other organization like. Uh, Fake Laha, mm -hmm. he, he knows the abbreviation, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is kind of organization they are working in collaboration with, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who was the organization? Oh, Feklaha. That's the. Uh, it's a very long acronym. Death by oh. acronyms. <laughs> yeah. uh, the Fellowship of Christian Councils and Churches in the Great Lakes and Horn of Africa. Yes. So Thank you for explaining that. I a, wasn't sure of the word that you said. It's a mouthful. I didn't, I didn't yeah. realize it was an acronym. When, yeah. when, we, when we want to intimidate people or do hazing for new people, we spit that out. And uh, no, but there there are similar sub regional. Uh, fellowships of church churches in Africa. In uh, there's one in West Africa. There's one in Southern Africa, and so we have partnered with them for a number of years as well. So um, they are instrumental in helping uh, the institutional development of their various members, including the South Sudan Council of Churches. And it's, it's interesting you both use the word partner and partnerships. It's not a sponsoring. It's not a. Uh, uh, dependent relationship. What do you mean by partnership in this context? Well, partnering means uh, that you accompany and that you walk. You don't control, you dialogue and you synergistically um, uh, share share space together for the better for the better good. So we are there to support uh, these institutions, which in turn support support others. So in the case of South Sudan, uh, the South Sudan Council of Churches, um, we Kairos and Kairos's predecessors, because uh, because Kairos was a, an amalgamation of. Uh, Eleven uh, prior uh, ecumenical uh, justice coalitions have supported the uh, the South Sudan Council. I mean, the, the Sudan Council of Churches uh, shortly after its inception in uh, in 1969, 
And then uh, during the period of civil wars and so forth, uh, there was the New Sudan Council of Churches based in Nairobi, which only worked in the rebel-held areas in the south, controlled by the, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and Army. And so and then there was this thing called the uh, Sudan Ecumenical Forum, which created a safe space for the people in the north and the people in the south to come together with international partners to dialogue around peace and development and, 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 a, and a variety of issues. So we've, we've, been, we've had these relationships for a long time. So uh, it's not about... And we're part of the peace process Part of the peace process, sure. Yeah, surely, yeah. Can, you know, ask you now, can you speak a little bit about the situation of, of the people the South Sudanese people. What's been the impact, and what remains the impact today, of the ongoing violence and warring uh, uh, factors, factions in the South Sudan? Well, like Jim said earlier, we have been in like uh, conflict since uh, 1955, in which we had just a little bit uh, break up, like from the, from the conflict, and then we continue again up to 2000 and. Uh, 11 when we have our uh, own country so it was like we were celebrating they was really happy they was uh, joyful that finally we we get uh, what we was fighting for and then two years later we was like back again for uh, uh, square one which so many people didn't see that coming so many people was uh, really surprised so many people was like um, you know just uh, before even they 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 finished uh, their celebration with uh, the the peace that they they got they find themselves in conflict so the the situation is um, like uh, you can see uh, like uh, everyone is uh, really traumatized with uh, all those kind of things that we we didn't even get to heal from 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 the war and then we have another war uh, going on so it's a really really big trauma and uh, it's um, it's affecting people in the, even in their daily daily process, their daily life. It's like, you know, you cannot come out uh, like at morning and you will guarantee that you will go back home safe, you know. Sometimes like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like uh, us, like girls, you know, like my mom can call me four or five times per day just to make sure that I'm okay, I'm safe, everything is okay. So it's just uh, put people in, in a position that no one is, uh, is secure anymore. Everyone expecting anything can happen at any time, in which is uh, like, really, really bad situation, yeah. What about the, the impact of the continued violence on women in the country? Is they, they've been particularly victimized. Yes, of course, because, you know, like uh, most of the conflict, you can see women are the vulnerable one and they are the one who mostly used, you know, like um, in the conflicting parties, most of the time women are the one to use, you know, to, you know, to uh, press the other one or to, you know, make the other party angry. So they face a lot of violence. They face a lot of insecurity, you know, like being a woman in a conflict uh, area, that means you are, you are hazard wherever you are going or in whatever you are doing and especially in South Sudan now like a lot of women have been displaced like if it's internally or externally you know some of them are in refugee camps and some of them are with the UN camps inside South Sudan but still they are not even safe even inside the camps they are not that much safe because the camps they are crowded the refugee camps are, are, are crowded in which even sometimes if they are not you know uh, they, if they didn't face the the these uh, the violence like the the sexual violence sometimes just they can be violated by word, they can be violated by discrimination because all the time, you know, they treat it like they're the less, you know, like they're just a tool, you know. So women are, are facing a lot of issues, are facing a, a lot of problems, and we think that uh, maybe only peace can solve the women problem and get them their rights. Well, so I was uh, doing some research on it too, and it, uh, I was reading that a UN United Nations survey found that 70% of the women who are sheltering in camps had been raped since the beginning of the conflict. And including um, violence performed on them by police and soldiers, supposed to be protecting them. We're gonna carry on with this conversation and come back after the break, talking about the work of the South Sudan Council of Churches and how they've been trying to address the impact of this violence on the people. The 
The following program is brought to you by Rogers Anyplace TV. Enjoy exclusive content for free. Visit RogersAnyplaceTV.com. Hi, my name is Gillian Parker, and I am host of Family in Focus. Join us this week when we'll be talking about losing a child. That's Family in Focus, only on Rogers TV. The holiday season is here, and it wouldn't be the holiday season without Operation Red Nose, a designated driver service that lets you celebrate until the party's over and then return home safely in your own car. The service is easy to use and free. Just call us and we'll drive you back to your home. For more information, visit OperationRedNose.com. Operation Red Nose, last call before you hit the road. Hey, Gabe, we're supposed to be at City Hall. We're gonna build it right here. Oh uh, yeah, sure and give wetsuits to all the visitors? <laughs> no, on the water. Hey, come on, we're talking about building something the size of 64 city blocks. And there's no land left in Montreal. So, get serious. Listen, we'll build islands. How? Dig up Montreal? <laughs> <laughs> They're digging a subway, remember? You take it from there, and you put it here. 12 months and 25 million tons of fill later, St. Helens Island was reshaped and Ile Notre Dame was created. Come on, we don't want to keep Mayor Drapa waiting, do we? Montreal's Expo 67. It would prove to be the most successful World's Fair of the 20th century. Politically speaking on Rogers TV, I'm Dave Salasi, your host. We're speaking today with uh, Awak Deng from the South Sudanese uh, Council of Churches and Jim Davis with Kairos Canada, talking about the, uh, well, in the context of the campaign against gender-based violence, but particularly as it pertains to this troubled uh, African country. And Awak, I, I your particular area of uh, volunteering with this Council of Churches is in the uh, as youth coordinator. Um, can you speak a little bit about how the war is affecting the youth in the country? Um, you know like in uh, most of the conflict youth are the the one who are used you know like uh, fire firewood you know so when whenever there is a f uh, fighting like uh, okay there is uh, all people go to fight also but most of the uh, majority will be the youth will be the young people so they are affecting by the, they are just find themselves fighting sometime that uh, for, for for reason that is not actually their own reasons you know and when the fight finish they are the one who faced by you know unemployed just uh, sitting uh, sitting around doing nothing and this is one of the things that led the used to be sometime you know um, uh, violence because they don't choose to be violent but they find themselves uh, with so much anger inside them they find themselves with uh, so much things that they they don't know how to deal with so they just you know uh, become violence against themselves or against uh, anyone else so in our program we are doing um, kind of uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call it exhibitions and we, we we have seminars in which you are trying you know um, it's uh, it's not a, an easy to to drag the anger outside of uh, of someone but we are trying to to let them you know like let them know if they they are able if they are able to talk at any time there is someone who will be there to to listen to them and uh, also uh, one of our seminars is like uh, giving them an ideas, you know, giving them information. It's uh, okay. We are not telling them don't go to fight. We are not telling them don't do this. But at least you are telling them if you are fighting, you need to have a reason. If you are doing anything, you need to have a cause for what, whatever you are doing. And it's uh, kind of uh, like opening their minds, opening, you know, not brainwashing, but let them uh, visualize their future. Let them, you know, see their life in in a more like better way. And uh, we are working on this with uh, coordination of uh, South Sudan Council of churches in which like we're adopting one of uh, their pillars they have city pillars for peace building which is uh, advocacy reconciliation and uh, neutral forum 
So we are, we are adopting the advocacy in which we are trying to reach uh, as much number as we can from the youth uh, by these uh, seminars and public worshiping exhibitions and uh, pass our messages in which they can be for their own development, they can be for leadership, they can be for decision making, like uh, whatever kind of uh, help that we can provide uh, for the youth because they are actually they are facing a lot a lot of things you know like unemployment like uh, I, I just said earlier is one of the problem that they are really facing and um, you know so uh, coming to the church sometimes is giving them you know the feeling that they are doing something they are you know participating in something so as much as we can give them we, we just uh, try to gather them and then um, uh, we, we hope they will be, you know, in better position because, like, they are tomorrow, you know, like, uh, they are the future for the country. If we, if we don't have uh, uh, a good use, if we don't have uh, someone that we can count on, that means we, we don't have tomorrow, we don't have future. So we're trying to build our tomorrow by trying to lift up our use. And that is uh, our program, yeah. Mm -hmm. When you started off, you were talking a bit about um, the, the youth being drawn into the conflict as participants in it. What, what ages are we talking about there for the youth being drawn in? Well, what, you what can be you can be flexible. You can be you know it, when it comes to the aging things, you know like thirty five and less um, below that. You know this is all our count as uh, as youth, and uh, there are the more people that are actually carrying guns, and there are the more people who are actually fighting. You know, so it's, uh, it's there is no specific uh, range of age, and that's why I said you can find old people also, um, including there. But the majority will be the young people, the majority mm -hmm. of uh, of those here yeah, who are uh, undergo the problems. Yeah. Do we see the recruitment of child soldiers uh, in the struggle? Well, I, I cannot answer that, uh, I cannot tell you more about it. But what I can say is that, like, human rights have been talking a lot uh, to the both uh, conflicting party to try, you know, uh, if there is those kind of issues so they can stop doing them. And uh, because uh, I'm in conf uh, child in armed conflict, this uh, is not uh, like a good choice for, uh, for a country who just, you know, get their uh, referendum. So uh, yeah, human rights have been talking a lot about this kind of issue uh, for uh, for the child that not to be you know in uh, armed positions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when we spoke initially in the uh, background to the conflict, talked about the split between the two leaders, and I understand in some ways that's been reflected in a. Um, uh, ethnic divisions within the country too, and I'm just wondering how do the youth in Sudan work with the different ethnic groups, and to bring about healing in the, in that area? Well, in uh, um, in our church, like. Um and uh, this is one of the messages that we are trying to to send out. We don't have this kind of uh, ethnic uh, ethnic problems or uh, or uh, where you come from. Like you know, the the church is uh, is consists of uh, so much people from from different places in which you can find. Uh, even there is others. Uh, those are not actually South Sudanese. They are from other places. But you don't ask someone where you from or where you come from. Sometimes he find himself working with someone for a long time, but you don't even know where he, he came from, you know, because uh, one of the things we are trying to do is treating people as they are human beings, regardless where they come from or what is their background, ethnic, you know. Just he's a, he's a human being, even if he's not a church believer, if in, he's not believing in anything else, but he is a human being, and this is the way he should be treated, and this is the way everyone should be treated. That, that is the, the basic. and. Uh, the youth are adopting that, uh, like not just adopting it. They have actually, they are really open-minded coming up to this kind of issues. I, uh, I'm not saying that the elders are not, uh, you know, like flexible. But what I'm saying that is, uh, among us, the youth, we like we already overcome the uh, idea of uh, ethnic groups and all those uh, kind of stuff. So we don't have that kind of things. And we hope uh, like uh, our message will go also out because this is the one of the things when we go for a public uh, worshiping or a public prayer. So people can see us, you know, because sometimes to get a message to someone, you need to be the model. So when they see us in harmony, when they see us all together and they know this is people are from different groups, these people are from different background, from different ethnic, maybe they will also adopt the idea and uh, one day we will be all, you know, like treating each other as just human beings. Other uh, potential areas for uh, miscommunication is with the elders. How uh, 
do you as youth work with elders within the church? We don't have miscommunication because they are actually our archive, they are our background, you know, even if uh, sometimes they get, you know, a little bit <laughs> messed up. <laughs> but yet they are they are the one who give us the courage, you know, because uh, they have been in our place before, they have uh, been in our shoes, so they know better. They wasn't born just like uh, or like that. So we, we need them in, in every step, we need them. We need to go back to them. And we, we are working actually together, like um, they are the one who, even sometimes, like in my church when I feel like uh, I'm, 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 I'm back down or I'm feeling this thing is not working they are the one who come and no 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 you have to do it you have to go you know like uh, they really courage us even if they are not in the the big picture but they are the basic they are the basic for us if without them I don't think we can do what we are doing now yeah so the working with the elder is actually a good thing and it's encouraging and one of the sample also of Mama Agnes, she's not here with me now, but we have been here together and she's have been like, you know, a big of help for me. So we, we need our elders, regardless of what they have been doing, but we need them because they are, yeah, they are the basic for our work. You and your partner Agnes have been modeling that <laughs> method of working, that yeah. method of being church yeah. in the country. <laughs> yeah. How about now, so a lot of what you been, have been speaking about has been the you know, the youth being the focus of uh, some of the efforts. What is the contribution of youth then to building that peace in South Sudan? Well, um, in um, in our program in which we are trying to change their mind or to change their idea, or to give them, you know, like developing themselves, this is... Uh, it's part of the peace building because if you took the anger outside of them, they won't be uh, any more, you know, uh, violating uh, any any rights if your uh, woman rights or anyone's else right, you know. And this is uh, one of the peace process. You, you you have to like heal them from whatever they are uh, going through, and then uh, maybe they, they they will be you know more more flexible to the idea of uh, being in peace, you know, because they already have the peace inside them, because peace is not you know it's not from outside. Peace starts within you, so that is what we are giving them, building the peace inside them, so they can build the peace outside. So yeah, and. Um, it, uh, we see the results actually are coming out because uh, a lot of people coming to our church, a lot of youth people coming to our church, and the way they are treating each other, the way they, they are behaving when they go outside, it gives an indicator of that uh, something is changing. It's, uh, it may take a while, it may take time, but it's, uh, it's changing, you know. So that is our contrib contribution to peace building. We are building the young nation. What about now? I mean, this is. Um the national women's programming. So what role have they taken, the women uh, in South Sudan, what role have they taken in promoting an authentic peace? Um, like women in uh, South, uh, South Sudan Council of Judges has uh, a lot of program that they, uh, they are doing and uh, they try to bring also the young girls and uh, young women uh, in those program. They have like, uh, f uh, recently they issued a women link Women, uh, South Sudan Council of Judges Women, Women Program link, and in, in which they are working like with different kind of women. It's a link in, in which uh, you have uh, politician women, you have women from uh, grassroots, you have all kind of women, and this is uh, one of program that uh, the Council of Judges is adopting. You know, to to to, to build the, the the women, to build um, to uh, empower them. You know, so uh, women are are the peace build or the, the peace keep actually because most of the agreement that women was uh, part of it they are the sustainable one so they are trying to reach them educate them give them uh, the, you know like empower them so those women can be one day you know part of the peace negotiation program and they can uh, they can come up yeah and there is a lot of uh, other program I wish my Magnus was here she can tell you more about them but yes, they are working with women in grassroots and women in uh, political position also. Yeah. Has you, is it necessary to try to deconstruct the patriarchal model of society? I don't, I'm not as familiar with the culture in South Sudan, but I've been to Africa a few times and sometimes there's some overriding cultural restrictions yeah. that would hold women back in trying to take on these kind of programs. Well, those kind of culture, they are, uh, they're a bit, you know, like uh, strong. They 
<coughs> they need more effort to, 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 you know, to, to break them. Because uh, South Sudan is an African uh, country in which uh, most of the, you know, the African cultures are as there. You know, in, in some, in some uh, society, women are not allowed to go even to school because they just see women as um, you know, something to be sold out. So just as soon as you are rich, certain age, you will be given to a man, regardless if he's older than you or if he's, you know, whatever. And in some cultures, women are not allowed even to speak because you are a woman. You don't, you don't have a right to go in front or uh, try to speak. So all those kind of cultures, they, they exist. And women are trying to, 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 to break them. You know, women are trying to let the man know that um, we are we are equal. We are not less than you. We are not, you know, we are not. Uh, yeah, we are vulnerable, but we still we have power. We can do something. We can change something. And uh, it uh, will be a little bit hard, you know, to <laughs> change the African man ideas about women. But uh, as we see, other men are actually treating women in, in in better way. They are uh, understanding that women are not less than them. So that means it will change. There is hope it will change, but it may take more effort, yeah. I know that, Jim, the, the Kairos has had a focus on supporting women's programs uh, in Africa and around uh, the majority world. Has there been an emphasis on youth as well, or...? Uh, well, there certainly are youth as part of the, uh, the, the Women of Courage program. Uh, we, we don't have an explicit program on, on that. We, uh, Kairos in general has many intergenerational um, efforts uh, going on, periodic conferences. Uh, of, uh, but the, the Women of Courage program has two components. Okay, and we'll have to pick up on that. Okay, we sure. come back from our break, and we're also going to look at your background and the Canadian connections, sure. on politically speaking. Thank you. Sorry, I had to cut you off. It was our 35th anniversary. To celebrate, we were on our way to Mama Rosie's, where we had our first date. That's when we heard coming from the radio. So we stopped and listened. It helped us get to safety. So when I think of, I think of our anniversary, because now we have even more to celebrate. Fires raged along the Saguenay River for more than 150 kilometers, destroying land and lives. One family survived by dousing themselves all night against the searing heat. One family, among the thousands whose resourcefulness and courage shaped the character of this land. With the new Rogers Anyplace TV app, now you can take your TV entertainment on the go. Watch the shows you want from anywhere on your favorite device. Hundreds of movie titles, your favorite shows, even sports and news, live or on demand, with a new look and feel that makes finding what you want easier than ever. And the best part? Any Place TV is already included with your TV package. Download the new app today and make Any Place a TV place. Lossi, and we're speaking today about the, uh, uh, the conflict in South Sudan and the work of the uh, South Sudan Council of Churches in trying to bring about an authentic, lasting peace. And uh, I, walk, I want to ask you now to talk a little bit about yourself. What happened in your life? 
to make you get active in this area with the Council of Churches and with as youth coordinator? Tell us some of your story. Well, I have been um, a member for the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, like uh, I am I'm a member like uh, the whole of my life, and then um, after the the conflict, you know, like um, so, uh, the personal experience, it doesn't have to be like something you face by yourself, but you you have been living it, you know. So I have been there since 2013, the conflict of 2013. I have been there 2016 again. I have been there, so I have been seen things. I I live through things, and I know people who have been you know like personal touched by those kind of uh, things that happened during the conflict. So and seeing all those kind of uh, stuff, you cannot just you know like sit back and watch. If you have something actually you can give, or you if have something that you can help people with you know so that is, uh, was uh, one of the things that uh, motivate us you know like to start uh, working uh, especially with the youth because you, you are walking around the street you see them everywhere just you know hanging around sitting you know doing uh, stuff that they shouldn't be doing you know so we start like uh, we was doing this uh, seminars even before the conflict, but there was just you know for the church members there was uh, a little bit exclusive. So after that we we we, we think of for uh, why don't we make them uh, more wider, make them more bigger, you know, so we can uh, gather as much as we can from those youth our side and try to help them by give them ideas. Yes, we cannot help them by giving them you know so money or something to go and uh, you know support themselves, but yet we can give them ideas in in which they can go and then start their their life you know in in, in a better way yeah so this uh, have been all those kind of things that people are living through not only me most of the youth in South Sudan they you know they have been living through all this uh, conflict so it uh, it just touch you and you feel like uh, okay if there is a small thing I can do then I'm, 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 I'm ready for it yeah this might be a difficult question with the faith it, the church, the role of the church, does it tend to provide impetus for people to take on a social role like you're talking about? Or is it people who have a need to uh, work in the social sphere, community sphere, find support in the church and a structure for doing their work? Which comes first, the faith or the work? <laughs> well, it's a church, so the faith comes first, of course. But uh, as uh, just I said, uh, the church is trying to help as much as he can. So if he if he can help you in in in, in other in whatever way that uh, they can provide their uh, their help, it's not necessary in 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 faith. It's not necessary in um, you know like in uh, association or in your own life. But whatever kind of help that church can provide, because there is an idea of uh, like we are people for for God. We are a God, you know like. We are spreading the word of God, so whatever kind of things that we're supposed to do in in God's name, we are you know we are willing to do it in helping people, like doing good things, not uh, the opposite way. Mm. So whatever comes first, if the church is like can do so, we are uh, they were providing the help that we can do. Yeah. And help me just understand this: is South Sudan primarily Christian, or fifty percent, or? Are most people majority. involved in churches, or what, what, what part of the population? Majority, is majority of the people in South Sudan are Christian, mm -hmm. uh, but then there is uh, like there is Muslim. They are minority, and there is uh, other which are not Muslim, not Christian. But um, I don't know about the percentage exactly. But the majority are uh, Christian. But in South Sudan. W like the idea of uh, Muslim or Christian or other believers, there is not that. Uh, there is no that kind of idea. So you can be Muslim, you can come to the church, you seek a help, you find the help, and you go without even asking you if you are a Christian or not. That's why I said that the church just is there for helping, uh, like whatever kind of help that they can uh, provide, even if it's not you know in, in in term of faith, even if you are not a Christian, even if you don't believe in God, and you come to the church and you're asking for the help, of course the church will uh, will help you. So the the idea of uh, wh uh, where you come from is not uh, actually a critical point. You are just helping. Yeah. So I can see in the face of the kind of struggles and situations you describe. It can be demoralizing. What gives you hope? What sustains you? 
Well, seeing uh, the work I'm doing, like it's actually making effort. Seeing the like seeing the people, like those who are I, I used to go down to them and try to gather them. Seeing them are uh, making their own life better is actually a big hope for me. And you know, um, sometimes you just uh, even if uh, they didn't come to you or tell you that this thing has helped me or this thing, you know is working with me but if you can see that their life have changed to a different direction that is really motivating you and even without going back to them you just feel yourself you are going you know more and more you are trying to do the best as you can do for others like the way you you, you do it for them and i thank the god the thank god and i thank the church also because the church is really helpful and it's really back us up at any time you feel like you know like you are helpless or you are not supportive you find the help from our elders in the church, you find the help from our pastors, yeah. So seeing that you are doing a good job is actually helpful. So you're saying your personal witness of the impact of the work on people's lives is what is keeping Motivating you Motivating me, yes. Long term, what's your goal? Uh, my goal for the long term, um, just seeing our country in better position, seeing uh, the youth are actually in a place they, where they sh should be, you know, seeing the youth are uh, more educated, are more uh, confident, more, you know, like self-determining, they can take their own decisions, they can decide for their own life, and uh, in which that means our country, of course, is in peace, so that is the big goal, peace for the country. Mm. Now, when we you mentioned peace again. That uh, touches on an area that uh, I, I feel is, is um, counteracting the desire of the people in South Sudan for peace. And Jim, I want to ask you about the military sales that are happening to South Sudan. Uh, we were talking before about the uh, Canada -owned, Canadian owned company selling over 170 armored vehicles to the South Sudan military. Uh, is that is that keeping the conflict going, or what's that about? Well, I'm sure there are many drivers of the conflict, and not exclusively from because of arms coming in from the outside. And there may be many argue enough arms there already to perpetuate the war for some time. Uh, but there is the moral imperative to have an embargo, a moratorium on arms, uh, going into the country. And I know that failed at the UN, and uh, others are. Um, uh, advocating that the UN uh, revisit that, uh, if, if at all possible. I mean, the larger issue is um, Canadian-owned arms firms that are subsidiaries in other countries, uh, for example, Gulf countries that may be providing arms. Um, and so there's those kind of loopholes which would be uh, important to tighten up such that um, we uh, we do all that we can. So um, I think the the imperative is 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 to if it can't be stopped, at least we speak out against it demonstrably. Uh, but uh, to the extent that uh, Canadian-owned firms uh, are are shipping arms uh, or selling arms to uh, uh, to South Sudan, um, that needs to be condemned, if, it, if not outright stopped. Uh, I'm not a legal expert, so I don't know what all, the, but our colleagues in civil society are calling for that as well. So, Yeah, I'm going to name the company. It's a, a Stripes Group, mm -hmm. and it has a factory in the United em Arab em Emirates. Emirates, excuse Emirates. me. Mm -hmm. uh, that it's been exporting the uh, armored vehicles mm -hmm. to yeah. South Sudan explicitly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you said the, the Resolution at the United Nations failed. Um, is isn't that uh, now? Was that a specific resolution for South Sudan, or the resolution to um, ban the export of weapons to any country where there's uh, questions that could, that could be used for human rights violations? I, I'm I'm afraid I can't tell you what the the uh, the specific resolution was, um, but um, the. Certainly, the, the the moral imperative would be to uh, to stop arms going into any any place where there's uh, uh, where there's armed conflict. Um, but um, the one uh, I'm thinking of is, is around South Sudan specifically, mm -hmm. uh, and there were some abstentions and and so forth that uh, precluded it uh, getting uh, the votes necessary to be to be passed. So.
Be because the the um, resolution I'm thinking of established the treaty to ban the sale of, of weapons to any region desi des designated as potentially mm -hmm. harmful to uh, uh, or lending itself to human rights violations. Now that's a treaty that exists, but Canada has never signed that treaty, correct? Uh, I'm not an expert in arms right. treaty. I would defer to my colleagues in civil society who, who study that uh, mm -hmm. more. So, um, but okay. it, it, it certainly makes sense uh, what, you, what you're saying. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does uh, any aspect of Kairos have um, the aspect of uh, Canadian uh, arms sales and Canadian uh, involvement in the international arms trade as part of its agenda? Well, uh, the Canadian Council of Churches uh, has an affiliated organization called Project Plowshares, which tracks that. Uh, they're based in uh, in uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, and in fact, as part of the tour, the uh, the uh, seven city, uh, four province tour, we did stop uh, and uh, we had meetings uh, with uh, people from Project Plowshares at the Basili uh, Graduate School uh, for International Affairs. Uh, uh, as well as at Conrad Grable, uh, which is a Mennonite uh, college at the University of Waterloo, about these these uh, these subjects, and it was the intent of uh, having uh, complementary civil society groups uh, um, reinforce that point that uh, arms uh, uh, need to be barred from from um, from conflict zones like South Sudan, mm -hmm. and that would. Maybe a, maybe this is a very naive observation or naive comment, but if there weren't the profit motive driving a lot of Western and Northern countries uh, who host most of the arms manufacturers, that if, if that was removed, that may help to contribute in some areas of the world, I'm not speaking necessarily about South Sudan explicitly here, uh, help to... Um, put a calming effect Attenuate. on the, I mean, I'm also thinking of right now uh, the uh, Saudi Arabia attacks on Yemen, you know. Mm -hmm. Again, that's another place where Canadian arms dealers have sold weapons to maintain the oppression of the civilian population there. Well, uh, I think uh, the reason for perpetual wars and uh, warmongering is uh, war is profitable. And uh, that's part of our capitalist uh, system. And uh, so, uh, to the extent that uh, uh, wars can be uh, provocated or uh, continued, uh, there are people, um, maybe the elites uh, uh, and um, those that invest in uh, arms industries or the mutual funds that support or the, the, the shares that, that support them, uh, it is profitable and that's why it continues. Otherwise, if war was not profitable, uh, we would have seen reason to uh, to stop it. Yeah. So, just to reinforce the point that you're, I think, trying to make. No, I see, that's exactly <laughs> it. And, and the recent release of the Paradise Papers mm -hmm. have, I think, revealed a few names of high-profile Canadians sitting on the boards of uh, arms dealers, arms uh, uh, trading companies, mm -hmm. uh, making enormous profits and, and funneling those profits away in tax free havens. Right. Yeah. We've got our job cut out for us here in Canada in order to support the efforts of people on the ground yep. in the developing country. Absolutely. Basically, I think that's Absolutely. the summary for what we're talking yeah, about. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, work, the work is here. Uh, as much as we think the work may be in uh, South Sudan, uh, there's much work to be done uh, here. And we'll come back after the break to finish up with uh, Jim and, uh, and uh, Alak uh, talking about South Sudan. I'm politically speaking. I don't know if I'm still on camera or not. Hi, I'm Julia Supa. Join me each week on In The Know as I welcome a local guest expert to the show. Each week is a different guest and a new topic geared towards getting you in the know. You'll learn everything from nutritional tips, design trends, how to balance your life, gardening, fashion, and so much more. If you're interested in being a featured guest expert, send us an email or visit us online at rogerstv.com slash in the know. And don't forget to watch In The Know right here on Rogers TV Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Send them home! Get rid of them! Gentlemen, gentlemen, please! And so, 
This organ, which I regret I cannot name, because of the presence of these members of the weaker sex, who, although they are married, could not possibly endure... <laughs> Get them out. This is Ginny. Patience. Get them out! Dr. McFarlane! Mrs. Trout. There's no place for women in a medical school. Yeah. Get them out! If you do not bring this classroom under control, I am going to repeat every word of this disgusting lecture to your charming wife. My friend Jenny Trout was not the only woman to face this kind of thing in medical school. But she would become the first woman licensed to practice medicine in Canada. It was John's graduation. We were so proud. We all got together for a picnic. That's when we heard coming from the radio. So we stopped and we listened. It helped us get to safety. That's why when I think of I think of John. Because now he has a real future to look forward to. Politically speaking, I'm Dave Salasi, your host. We've been talking about the tour that's been sponsored by Kairos. Uh, it has 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Our walk has been going across the, the country, yeah, out to uh, out west, back down to Ottawa, and finishing off the uh, tour today. Tell me, from your perspective as an African woman, what did you learn from this tour here in Canada? I, I have been visiting seven cities in Canada, in uh, city prov uh, four provinces. I don't actually remember the name very quiet, but I remember Thunder Bay, I remember Montreal, and uh, Kitchener Waterloo, and there is um, other cities we have been uh, going through. So. And you don't have to remember how to say Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah, Saskatchewan. <laughs> and so. everybody remembers Montreal. <laughs> because I like it. <laughs> so uh, we, we came here for like, um, uh, Kairos Canada invited us to come and share our story, but we also end up like learning a lot of uh, things from uh, from Canadian. Like uh, one of the things I learned from the Canadian that they are really strong, you know. Like um, they have their problems, they have their issues, but yet they are not giving up. They are still fighting. They are still trying to get back their 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 like their rights, you know. Like the um, indigenous people. When I came to Canada, I, I didn't know about uh, about them. I didn't know that they have issues. I didn't know that they have problems, you know. So I, I, I came to, to learn also uh, a lot of things about Canadian that I, I didn't know. So one of the things, like I said, I learned from them, the, the, their courage and, um, you know, their strictness that they still fighting their, uh, their battle. They are not uh, giving up. And also uh, we went to one of the healing centers in which uh, a man talked to us about how to you know how to have peace in in which he he told us that um, they have four uh, four four phases of things I don't quite remember but he was telling us that you have to have your own peace and then you can give someone else because if you don't have peace how can you give someone else peace you know so uh, I, I I learned a lot of things from uh, from from Canadian actually and I I am willing to take all those kind of things back to our country we have uh, maybe the same problems or even maybe less. But the problem is back there we don't talk about our problems. Mm. We don't talk about our issues in which sometimes it came out in terms of anger because we just keep anything inside. Anything is just, you know, kept inside and then people just, you know, explode, you know, for, for no reasons. But uh, learning how to how to talk about their issues, how to, you know, how to spell them, it's actually one of the healing process because if you talk about them, that means you are facing them. And as soon as you are facing your problem, then the solving will be, you know, just gen the next step, and it's uh, it's not going to be that uh, much hard. And we also attend um, blanket exercise. A kind of blanket, a kind of blanket exercise. Blanket exercise, yeah. yeah which that, that's also, a, that's an experience recalling the history and experience of the First Nations people. Yes, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. in which they are talking about their things. You know, they're talking why they cannot uh, get over it. You know, so if we learn how to talk, why we cannot get over it, maybe one day we will get over it also. Yeah. It's really helpful often to hear 
the insights about Canada and Canadians from someone who's not uh, from here, who's from a different culture, yeah. a different part of the world, to see ourselves through a different lens and a different mirror. Yeah. What about yourself now? What do you want to bring back to share with the youth in South Sudan? Well, uh, along of my journey, I met uh, a lot of uh, youth. Uh, like uh, they 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 have programs. They are working uh, within their uh, their uh, you know like their circles when, in which they are trying. You know, there is some program uh, they they are defending uh, women. There is some program they are defending youth uh, youth in, in in general. And I try to to be uh, like in connection uh, with them. So what I'm taking back from here is like you sometimes are you know. They, they feel like they give up, they feel like they just, you know, like uh, they don't care. But telling them that you are not alone, there is uh, somewhere else in other place, just like you have problems, even more than your problems, but he's still trying to help others, not even just himself. It's one of the things actually I'm, I'm taking back there because they, they sometimes telling people about the stories, telling people about the things that are outside there, make them see things from different perspective, it's helpful. So yeah, I hope to take uh, all the uh, all the experience that I, I I learned here back to our country, back to the youth that I'm working with, and I hope that it will carry them as much as it was uh, encouraging me. Thank you. Yeah. And in the last minute, Jim, what's next steps for Kairos? Well, we certainly want to continue the the dialogue with the uh, the government of uh, Canada. We had a good meeting with uh, 30 or so. Uh, people from the Global Affairs Canada, the South Sudan uh, division, around talking points uh, about uh, additional funding for uh, grassroots uh, uh, women's organizations or that involve uh, uh, women peace builders. And uh, uh, we don't just want uh, women uh, at the table, they need to be listened to, and we need to have nonpartisan women. Um, the South Sudan uh, Constitution uh, has uh, a quorum, or as as uh, uh, twenty five percent of the representatives in their their national assembly are for women, but they are in some sense patriarchally conditioned to report to their political leaders. So we need women to have. Uh, from a variety of socioeconomic uh, backgrounds who authentically represent various groups come to the table and be listened to to make uh, the difference that we know they can. Okay, listen, Jim, that's great. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for coming up tonight and being able to sh share the stories from Kairos. Awak, thank you very, very much for coming and for your whole tour in Canada. Thank and you. best wishes and prayers with you and your ongoing work in Sudan. Thank you. This is Dave Selassie. You've been watching Politically Speaking on Rogers TV. Look forward to joining you next time. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. I'm strictly legit. You're funny. You're really something. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Oh my goodness! Damage out on the GBM and the rest of the team is gonna be extreme! You lied to me! Didn't see that coming, did you? Touche. So you're in. Yeah, I'd say that. It was my daughter's birthday. She was blowing out the candles on her cake when we heard. Coming from the TV. So we stopped and listened.